بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده سبحانه وتعالى ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله عز وجل به الغمة وجاهد في سبيل ربه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد Respected brothers in Islam I would like to really from the bottom of my heart congratulate you the brothers sisters in Perth here are they actually changed my standards because in Sydney with the boys, if I try to have a conference from 8 to 6, I'll be shot by the afternoon. <laughs> and your concentration and your patience is really, really, really impressive. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. May you benefit, inshallah, today. Allah, amazing environment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the organizers and help them and support them to do more of, you know, events as such, inshallah, for our benefit and the community's benefit. Jazakumullah khair. Now, I would like to bring the, the event more to us. I'd like to bring the topics and the concerns and the concepts more to our religion in our time. My brothers and my sisters, we have a problem. We have a big problem. We are living in a time that's not easy. It's time of fitna and corruption. The majority of people are far away from deen. People are too busy in the worldly life. Purpose of life is not clear. Direction is not clear except with the ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved and protected. And when we hear about seerah, when we hear about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we hear about migration, sacrifice, battles, we have to start looking at seerah in a very, very different way. The majority of us, most of us, we read seerah like a story. It's a very, very interesting story. You hear, mashallah, you know, Bilal, Khabbab, Ammar, Uthman, Umar radiallahu anhu, how they accepted Islam. It's a very, very interesting story. Parents teach their children, uh, you know, young youth who sit there and talk to each other about. It's something very, very interesting, but something is missing. A factor is missing. This factor is how does this story influence me? What am I learning from this story? How is this story changing my life, changing my direction? When I leave, the, when I leave this convention tonight, am I the same person that walked in in the morning or am I a different person? Unfortunately, many of us deal with Dean like it's a magazine. It's a nice story, entertaining. You know, mashallah, we, we come, we enjoy ourselves, it's a beautiful environment, but benefit is not maximized because we are viewing it in the wrong way. We have to look at seerah as a lesson, as a warning. So I start by asking my brothers and my sisters, why are we in this world? I'm sorry, I'm maybe, maybe it's a long shot, maybe I'm, I'm taking a wide U-turn to come back to my topic, but it's very important. Foundations are very important. Why are we here in this dunya? Do you know or you were lost? Why are we here in this dunya? Huh? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, correct? More detail. Jazakallah khair. That's the only word I wanted to hear today. We are here in this dunya, not on a vacation. We're not on a holiday. It's not a, you know, lovely, beautiful place to be in. We are here in this world, basically, to be tested, to be purified. The heart of the son of Adam, because of the corruption and attachment to this world, is in the wrong direction. There's mistakes, there's weaknesses, there's diseases. The purpose of your life is to work on this heart by deen. For this heart to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on judgment day, a clean and sound and healthy heart. 
one condition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, on ju- uh, describing judgment day, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ On judgment day, your money will not help you, your children will not help you, your degrees will not help you, uh, your job will not help you, your family will not, nothing will help you except meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a clean and healthy heart. Now what does clean and healthy heart mean? I'm alright. I'm fine. It's not as simple unfortunately. A clean and healthy heart from a religious perspective has conditions. And you will never understand seerah. You will never understand the biography of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the environment in Mecca and Medina unless and until you know these conditions. Basically, my brothers and my sisters, to meet Allah with a clean and healthy and sound heart, Allah and His Prophet must be. It's not optional. It's not recommended. It's not all it would be nice if we are like this. Allah and His Prophet must be number one in your heart. What does La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah mean? Do you think it's a simple word you utter on your tongue that has no influence on your life and your actions? You think it's, a, it's, a, it's on your ID card? Some Muslim countries have, you know, ID cards say they're religion, Muslim. In Egypt, in my country, they say at Diana, Muslim. Religion, Muslim. You think it's, a, it's an ID, on your identity card? Islam is much more deeper than this. We have to meet Allah with a clean and healthy heart that has Allah and His Prophet number one. This is the meaning of the kalima of Tawheed. When I say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning in my heart, I hold no one in the rank of Allah and after him the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nothing comes before that. No wife, no nafs, no luxury, no children, nothing. Allah and His Prophet come first. Now if I ask the audience here tonight who he thinks in his heart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet come first makes it go and do some homework I want you to choose five of your best friends and ask them seriously Anjad Billah Alek do you love Allah and his prophet more than everything in the world what will everyone answer what will everyone answer are you serious you know, people straight away get offended. Are you asking me? Baba, wallahi, Allah and His Prophet come before anyone in my life. I will die for deen. Because claims are very, very easy. Anyone can make a claim. Anyone can make a claim. But the problem is, my brothers and my sisters, that on judgment day, these claims will not benefit us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you to present proof. Like in court here, if you are accused of a murder, the judge will ask you, what's your defense? Say to the judge, wallahi, I didn't kill. Habibi, tell me something. You can't say to the judge, judge, wallahi, I put my hand on the mushaf. Wallahi, I didn't kill him. No, 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 no. Give me proof. What is the proof in your life? Here is your book. Here's the movie of your life. I want you to point out to me what is your proof that Allah and His Prophet came first before anything in your life. And I'm telling you, sadly, many of us will fail. Many of us will fail to prove these facts. The Prophet said in the authentic hadith in Bukhari, and please listen carefully. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لا يؤمن أحدكم. None of you is a true believer. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. None of you is a true believer until I become more beloved to him than his parents and his children and all humanity. Meaning, my brothers and my sisters, if there's anyone or anything in your life that you love more than Allah and His Prophet and Deen, you will be in trouble on Judgment Day. You will be in trouble on Judgment Day. 
And this is why we study Sirah. This is why the Sahaba radiallahu anhum passed on the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he dealt with them and what he taught them. And the Tabi'een after them, generation after Sahaba, passed it on to the generation after them so that the heritage remains and every Muslim that comes to this world understands what is required of him. If you read Sirah in light of this understanding, everything will make sense. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the best religion, with the best deen. He came sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proclaiming and announcing what's known to fitrah, what's known to nature. Justice, peace, manners, birr al you know, uh, dealing good with the neighbor. Com common sense, everyone will agree. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the fitrah. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, many of them straight away accepted Islam. Shadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. But this was not enough. The kalima you say is not enough. The word you utter is not enough. Allah wants more than words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Alif la meem. Ahasib al-nasu. أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون. Did people think that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will let them be? He will let them say آمنا آمنا. We are believers. We are believers. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will not test them. ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم. We have tested those before them. فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين. With these tests. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. Before you do anything, Allah knows your claim whether it's true or false. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants on judgment day to prove to you, basically to shut you up. You say, I'm a believer. I say, come here, Habibi, look, read. Look what you've done. Look on that day what you preferred, the sunnah or something else. Look on that day. You claimed you love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are shy of his sunnah. You are shy of his path. Look at that day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is haram. And you fell in haram, fulfilling your desires and your shahawat, and you neglected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's orders. The purpose of this dunya is this test. And my brothers and my sisters, if we do not wake up and realize that these tests are coming our way, whether you like it or not, you are dreaming. You are lost. You do not know why you are here. We are here to be tested. Whether you like it or not, you are here to be tested. You are here to be trialed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prove your iman. Day in, day out. And if you don't like it, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-insi, in istata'atum an tanfudhu min aqtari samawati wal-ardi, fanfudhu, la tanfudhuna illa bi sultan. If you're not happy with the law of the land, get out of here. Leave, try and leave the heavens and the earths. Anta maqhoor. You are forced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take this test. There is no running away because he is your creator. You know in Australia here, they say to you, if you're not happy with our law, get out of here. Go back on your ship, go back to your own country. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lahul Mathal A'la said the same thing. If you don't like the world, you don't like these rules, go to another universe that someone else created. There is none. You are forced to take the test. Now Muslims, like I said, the majority of them are living in this world like it's a holiday. And in this holiday, because of our conscience and because we get exposed to Quran and Sunnah, we try taking painkillers or ecstasy drugs to forget. You know, when someone is stuffed in his life, there's so much problems, there's so much mashakir, he lives in depression, straight away he reverts to drugs to forget. Muslims in this world are not living the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And because they know they're not living it, and it doesn't make sense when they read the Quran and the Sunnah and hear about the Seerah, they start taking drugs. What drugs? A Umrah here and there. A nice Hajj, you know, five star, beautiful service, open buffet in Arafat. You know, I, I, I'll pray my five times Salah, Alhamdulillah, I pray. Are you serious? I pray. 
Allah owes me, I pray. Or I'll grow my beard, or I'll wear my scarf, and I will consider this, Alhamdulillah, brother, I have deen. Alhamdulillah, I have deen. But the deen you have is not the deen we are reading of. The deen me and you have is not the deen we are reading of in seerah. So that's clearly something wrong. And this something wrong is the gap between us and the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, the gap between a sick heart and a sound heart. Now in light of this introduction, I would like to re-explain seerah to you. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, came with this deen. The Sahaba proclaimed their faith and their iman and straight away from day one, the washing machine started. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started testing them to cleanse and purify their hearts and make these hearts pure and sound. Straight away, persecution. We, read, we heard, mashallah, wa mashaykh in the initial stage, how the Sahaba radiallahu anhu suffered, how they were tested, how they were persecuted, how they were first to migrate, the first migration to Abyssinia, many of them, how they lost family members just because of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. But this was only the beginning of the test. Then the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when their hearts reached a certain level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted more sacrifice from them. The test reached the next stage. They were asked to migrate and leave their beloved homes, leave their property, leave their money, and leave everything they have worked for all their life only for the sake of Allah and His Prophet. They were asked to leave and abandon. Leave everything to the extent, my brothers and my sisters, many of the Sahaba, after the conquest of Mecca that we will just talk about soon, inshallah, after Mecca was conquered, when they came back to their own homes, they were ordered to even lower their gaze. They were not allowed to enter their own homes back again, even though the buildings still existed and they still had ownership of it. Many of them, they went back and they lowered their gaze. What they left for the sake of Allah is, go is gone, never to return back again. And they all went back to Medina radiallahu anhum ajma'in with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they were migrants. They left these things for the sake of Allah. Sahaba radiallahu anhum migrated, they left, they sacrificed their wealth, their families, their homes, and then when they prove to Allah that they have passed this test, now the third stage of testing, the third stage of the washing machine. Ever seen a washing machine in function? You know in these comedy movies sometimes, you get someone stuck in a washing machine and you see his head rolling around in a little circle, you know that sight in comedy movies sometimes? Our deen is exactly like a washing machine. This deen, this Islam, it does the purpose of the washing machine. You enter saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasul from the beginning, and you end with your deen with a clean and pure heart. You get washed completely. These are the tests of our deen. And they are always on the rise. The higher and stronger your iman, the stronger the tests you will receive until you reach a complete and healthy heart that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sahaba sacrificed, accepted Islam, migrated. Still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted one more thing from them. Allah wanted every companion to prove to Allah and to prove to his prophet that they prefer this deen more than their own selves. And this is what we call the ultimate sacrifice. When I want a sacrifice, I can give you some money. You know, sometimes you go to a brother, call him to Allah. He's a busy man. He's, a, he's got businesses, mashallah. Say, brother, please come to the mosque. Say, Habibi, how much do you want? I'll give you an open check. Just leave me alone. Leave my lifestyle alone. I will support your organization. I will help you. I will build the masjid for you. I will give you money. Because money is cheap. Money has no value in my eyes. I will give you money, no problem. But leave me alone. I don't want your money. I want you. I want you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the period from the beginning of migration to the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wanted the companions to prove 
complete submission. Ya Allah, you and your prophet and your deen come before my own self. I will happily give my life, not my money, not my wife, not my child. I will give my own life for this deen. And this is the new stage we will speak about today, my brothers and my sisters. Sahaba radiallahu anhum migrated. And like Sheikh Siraj Wahaj, mashallah, said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse in the Quran saying, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ For 13 years in Mecca, the decree of Allah, the test of the time, was كُفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ Hold back your hands, don't even defend yourselves and establish your salat and work on your iman and your knowledge and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the test of the initial years. After migration and the establishment of the Islamic State, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse and many scholars consider this verse the first permission to fight back. Shortly after, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is that Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu, at the time a non-Muslim, a big enemy of deen, has taken a caravan that has a lot of money from Quraysh, the people that threw them out of, you know, their own place. The, the, the dealings, the trade route between Quraysh and Sham was very famous. Rihlat al shitai was Saif. They had two famous trips in summer and in winter. Dealing and trade with the Sham, the Roman and Byzantine Empire at the time. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, found out that a big caravan full of money with Abu Sufyan is coming back from Sham to Quraysh. And where does Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now? He is in Medina, on the way. So Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with a few believers around him in the new community in Medina, are in economic struggle. Because I want you to imagine, just for you to understand the sacrifice of the Ansar, the locals of Medina, Medina's population approximately doubled in a couple of months. I want you to imagine here, Perth, Masalan, population is 1.6 million. I want you to imagine if in a couple of months, the population in Perth becomes 3 million. What will happen to jobs? What will happen to food? What will happen to prices? Everything will rise. Double, straight away. So Medina already a small community with the migrants right here from Mecca to Medina. Now Allahu Akbar overpopulated considering the, uh, you know, considering the resources of the, of, the, of the city. Very, very tight conditions. The Ansar sacrificed despite poverty. They, they made Muhajireen their brothers. They gave them their own wealth. Now the Muhajireen all their money has been stolen by the kuffar. They took their houses, they took their money, they took everything. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decides to attack the caravan of Abu Sufyan. Now when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes a decision, mind you, don't think the Muslims at the time had a prepared army. Not even the seed of an army. Muslims were simple people at the time, very, 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 very simple, a very primitive army. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, handpicked 313 or 314 men, an unprepared army. When I say unprepared, I'm talking about, in some narrations, one horse. Can you imagine an army of one horse? Swords were a rare commodity. Swords were something uh, that was big in the time. Not everyone had a sword. Some people had swords. Other had rocks. Other had a, a dagger from his kitchen, you know. Another person had a stick or something. An unprepared army going to attack a couple of soldiers guarding the caravan of Abu Sufyan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had different plans. This was the plan of the believers. This was the plan of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the washing machine had a different scenario completely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was after the companions' hearts. He subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that Abu Sufyan found out. Information was leaked and Abu Sufyan knew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions are coming to attack the caravan. So he took a different route. 
a different route than the one usually taken by the caravans of Quraysh. And straight away he sent a knight, a horseman, back to Quraysh to tell them that Muhammad has become so arrogant, he wants now to attack Quraysh. Prepare an army straight away. So the horseman, of course, with high speed, arrives in Quraysh. Quraysh, already upset, already burning for Muhammad and his companions. They are in safety, they are in Medina now. They prepare a full army, 1,000 soldiers. And they plan an attack on the 313 Sahaba radiallahu anhum with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want you to imagine you, your morale. I want you to live this story to understand when tests face you in this world, when tests face you in your time. This is the lesson we need to learn. This is why we read and study Sirah, to put yourself in the feet of Sahaba and see if our choices will be similar. Because these are the signs of sound hearts and true Iman and true belief, not claimed Iman and claimed belief. Put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself. We're 313. We say, you know, some boys, I don't know, Perth is very quiet, mashallah. I'm sure there's gangs here, but where I'm from, there's gangs everywhere. You know, we're, we're a big group of people, you know, 100 boys or something, and we find the haram free Aussies on the beach. I'm sorry, that's it, mate. I'm going to smash them. Let, let's all attack them. Very, very easy. It's, a very, it's, a, it's an interesting brigade. It's an interesting fight. We can end up jumping these guys and knocking them out in no time. This was the morale of Sahaba radiallahu anhum. 313 versus a couple of soldiers protecting the caravan. Turns out the 313 now are fighting 1,000 soldiers of a prepared army ready to fight complete. More in number, more in arms. What will you do? Will you say to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sorry, Rasulullah, wallah, my wife is sick. <laughs> or Prophet of Allah, Wallahi, I love you. Wallahi, I love your deen. Wallahi, I love Allah and His Prophet. But I have to go back to work. Uh, the holiday is finished. <laughs> I have to go back to work. Sorry, Rasulullah. Uh, Rasulullah, wallah, I'm feeling a migraine. I'm a bad headache. Wallah, please, I'm sick. Can I be relieved? You know all the excuses we come about when we get tested? Every time we get tested, we have become masters in excuses. We say, brothers, mashallah, Australia is a, it's, it's a free country. Work, call to Allah, spread your deen, show your deen. No, we reverse it here in Australia. Someone says, brother, pull up, worship Allah properly. He goes, mate, this is not a Muslim country, this is Australia. It's Australia, mate. Different world, mate. People here don't understand hijab. You don't understand niqab. You don't understand if it scares them. Let me shave. Let me take off my scarf. And inshallah, in 50 years time, we'll start doing it. Why? Because we want to run away from the test. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found out the news. The 1,000 soldier army is coming to attack. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, makes mashura with the companions. And please give me your hearts and ease. Please concentrate. The Muhajireen, the migrants, are the ones who left what back behind in Mecca. Are you with me or are you sleeping already? They left behind everything. These guys are already sort of semi-trained. The Prophet of Allah says, leave your house. Yes, Ya Rasulullah, let's go. Leave your money. Yes, no problem. So when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, what should we do now? Should we fight or should we go back to Medina? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stood up. Are you, Prophet of Allah, are you serious? We will fight and Allah will give us victory. This man, khalas, he left everything anyway. He's got nothing to lose. The Prophet of Allah sallam, still doesn't decide. So Umar radiallahu anhu, you know, Umar a bit angry. Came out. He got, hey, are you serious, Ya Rasulullah? Of course we will fight. Are we going to give our backs to our enemies? So Muhammad sallam, still doesn't decide. So a man by the name of, please memorize his name. For Allah's sake, for your sake, for your children's sake, memorize this man's name. His name was Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh was one of the leaders of the Ansar, those in Medina. The Ansar are new Muslims. 
call them converts in our context, you know. New Muslims, one year, two year, Battle of Badr happened in year two Hijri. Ansar, the early Ansar accepted Islam maybe two years before migration, Bayat al-Aqab al-Ula, maybe three years. We're talking about a guy on Deen four years, it's too shaky, one year, just accepted Islam last year. And the Prophet of Allah now was asking, what should we do? Let's go fight. Fight? Yani you came, took our money, Musharraf. I gave you my land. Uh, me and my kids haven't been eating properly for the past two years because of you. Now come and fight? The Ansar radiallahu anhum, the treaty with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was what? What was the treaty with Rasulullah? That we will defend you so long as you are in Medina. This was the bay'ah. The bay'ah was the Prophet. The oath of allegiance of the Prophet was we will protect you so long as you are in Medina. You leave Medina, it's none of our business anymore. But it's not Islam. Don't worry about the bay'ah. It's not deen. Deen, the heart requires more than that. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiyallahu anhu. This man stood up. Qala ya Rasulallah, ka'annaka ta'anina, O Prophet of Allah, are you sort of waiting for the Ansar? Is that why you, you, you haven't decided to fight yet? And then he makes an amazing statement. He goes, a Prophet of Allah, Wallahi, we will not say to you, like Banu Israel said to Musa alayhi salam, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إنها هنا قاعدون Go you and your Lord, fight, we're waiting here for you. بل نقول لك اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إن معكم متبعون You go and your Lord, fight, we are with you, we will follow you. O oh, Prophet of Allah, by Allah, the money you take from us is more beloved to us than the money you leave with us. Look at the Iman. Look at the seerah, my brothers. Look at the requirement of faith. Look at the requirement of Jannah. You want to go Jannah, this is the heart you need. If your heart is sick, problems on Judgment Day. His heart is genuine. He is talking the truth. He is talking to the Prophet of Allah. He says, by Allah, the money I give for deen is more beloved to me than the money I, give, I keep myself. O Prophet of Allah, if you want, give us orders now and we will cross with you a rub al khali, birak al ghamad min the Yemen. For Allah, between Saudi and Yemen on the border, there's a, a place, an area called the rub al khali, the empty quarter. It's called the Death Valley. Anyone who went there in the time used to die. Very, very harsh conditions. If you want to cross this now with us, we will cross it with you, O Prophet of Allah. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the first time since the beginning of the discussion, smiled. Yes. This is what I was waiting for. The statement of Sa'ad, the Ansar are ready to fight, even though it's beyond the bay'ah, beyond the deal. Why? Because they wanted to prove to Allah. This man, my brother Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, because of these situations and these positions, he died shortly after, we will hear his story inshallah, he died after the battle of Al-Khandaq. Only seven years a Muslim. Yani many of us here have been in Islam more than him. Seven years a Muslim. Seven years a convert. But when he died, اِهْتَزَّ لِمَوْتِهِ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَنِ when he died, the throne of Allah shook for the death of Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, authentic hadith. Jibreel alayhi salam came to Muhammad and said, Ya Muhammad, who of you ummah died today? The throne of Allah shook for his death. So Muhammad salam said straight away, Akhsha an yakuna Sa'ad. Probably it's Sa'ad radiallahu anhu. I left him sick after the battle of Al-Khandaq. Seven years and the throne of Allah shook for his death. Do you reckon anything will shake for our death? Do you reckon anyone, any, anything of the unseen will move for our death? Seven years, my brothers, of sacrifice, and look where they reached because they were genuine in the quest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet of Allah says, Bismillah, we will fight. 313 people facing an army of 1,000. I want to ask you a question, my brothers. What do the odds look like? I want you please to stop, stop answering me from Islamic information you have. Stop giving me answers you've been taught as a kid. Of course, Allah gives Nusra. <laughs> I want you to live the story. We hear 500 people now and we say, let's go for a fight. 
we're going to go fight. We're not prepared. There's no weapons. We will fight a proper army, a military, with tanks and airplanes. Let's go. You will say, the Sheikh has lost the plot. <laughs> the guy is a haram. He's over, overdosed on the food. Something is wrong with him. What do you mean fight? How will we fight? Who are we fighting? Are you serious? It's an army. It's not a joke. And it's not a movie like the one you watch in Arisala. You know the movies, you know, we show, mashallah, a di directors and, you know, cameramen and, you know, they try to make it. It's real war. It's not brave heart and some blood and fake blood, you know. Real war. These people will really die. He really won't go back home to his wife. Guess what? He does not even have a chance to say goodbye. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> no, nowadays, <laughs> subhanAllah. Sometimes, you know, I take a Hajj group every year. Sometimes we go before the Hajj plane, you know, going to, we go pick up the brothers from the houses. He's going for around three weeks, set time, safe environment, return ticket is booked. His wife knows exactly when he's coming back. And the hugs and the kisses and the crying and the kids are outside on the doorstep and the haram. It's a whole funeral in the house. Because he's going for three weeks for hajj, safe, mashallah, secure. He'll be in five-star hotels. He'll call his wife every day five times. And still, it's like so much sacrifice. She's crying, he's crying. And then he enters the car. <laughs> Do you reckon Allah will accept us? <laughs> Imagine if I say to him in the mosque, let's go now. No calling home. No returning home before you leave. From the masjid, straight to the battlefield. Like wallah. <laughs> he will swear at me. And my organization. And my mosque. <laughs> no way. You say, say Sheikh, this is not Islam, it's not wisdom. You know, when we get stuck, we always say wisdom. Whenever we get stuck, no, no, brother. No, no, brother. It's not wisdom. Wisdom is you go home, take your wife on a holiday first. You're going to die. Mahalas. Take her on a nice holiday to Malaysia. Take the kids, you know, spend some good time with them. And then if they are ready, we'll praise the Khara for 1,000 years. And inshallah, if we feel content, we will come with you, inshallah. Sahaba radiallahu anhum had to make on the spot decisions to follow the prophet and prefer akhirah over dunya and they passed with flying colors wallah 1000 3000 1 million our lives are for deen and they followed muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam basically on a suicide mission now i want you to understand my brother something very important in all this life of sacrifice we live so-called sacrifice so-called tests really allah does not want your dunya really allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to take your life allah is only testing your willingness to give your life and give your money and give your wife and give your son when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered ibrahim alayhi salam to slaughter ismail he didn't really want Ismail to, be, to die. He didn't really want Ibrahim to slaughter his own son. He was testing Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice Ismail for the sake of Allah. And Ibrahim alayhi salam passed. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum in Badr were tested the willingness to give their lives for the sake of Allah despite of very, 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 very bad odds. And they all left. They followed the Prophet of Allah with their sticks and their rocks and their daggers to fight a prepared army. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah, very easy. Very easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave orders. Allah gave orders. Allah gave orders for the angels to descend to earth and fight with the Muslimin. Fight with the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know, Wallahi al azim ayat, if you read the Quran, knowing the seerah, bearing in mind what I told you at the beginning, you will actually for the first time in your life start benefiting from wahi. 
start benefiting from revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have sent down these angels. Give strength to the believers. Don't think, Allah after the battle says, don't think the angels were sent down to win the battle for you. My brothers and sisters, do you think Allah needs angels to beat an army of a thousand people? Allah needs angels. Allah needs the believers. Allah needs the swords and Kun fayakun. If Allah wanted to destroy the army of the kuffar with one order, there will be dust in no time. But it's all a stage test for the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to see what they put forward, deen or dunya. The Allah and His Prophet and Islam or the nafs and the shahawat and their desires. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave orders to the angels to descend to support the believers morally that they will win. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where was he in the battlefield? Where was he? In Badr. Where was he? Who knows? Go. No, no, he wasn't such. There wasn't dua. The Prophet of Allah left the battlefield. <laughs> Look at the understanding. The Prophet of Allah had the strength of 40 men. Yani he himself is like 40 soldiers. And the Sahaba narrate and they say, Kunna idha hami al -watis. When the fighting heated up, we used to barricade behind Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very, very strong man, Prophet of Allah. But in this battlefield, the Prophet of Allah, they built him a little shack and he sat in the shack. He raised his hand making dua. Why? Because he understood it has nothing to do with the battlefield. It has to do with what? The Nusra of Allah. If Allah decides that. This is the Iman and the Yaqeen they had. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were waiting for the Nusra of Allah and because they submitted and they sacrificed and they passed the test, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory in no time. In no time. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum took over the battlefield and the Mushrikeen fled the battle scene. Seventy of the leaders of Quraysh, seventy of them, were killed in the battle of Badr. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after collecting the spoils of war, and after chucking the bodies of these enemies of deen in the, in the well, the Prophet of Allah went to the well and said, Do you believe now that I'm the Prophet of Allah? Do you believe now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us victory? And the Muslims passed the test, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Badr was a, ma a big milestone in deen. The first battle, the Muslims, you know, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed the enemies of deen what they're really made of. But then, are the Sahaba now ready? No. The washing machine continues. They move from Badr, which was in year two after Hijrah, to the battle of Uhud, year three after Hijrah. In the battle of Uhud, the mushrikeen, the enemies of deen, all the leaders have been killed, humiliated. They are now full of anger and rage. They want revenge. They are seeking revenge. So the leaders of Quraysh, the remaining leaders of Quraysh, they, subhanallah, they collect their forces and their powers and everything and their money. And they prepare a 3,000 strong army to attack Medina and finish it once and for all. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finds out the news. He makes again mashura with the companions. What should we do? The Prophet of Allah's opinion was that they should stay in Medina and protect it. And some young companions did not like this opinion. They wanted to go out and face the kuffar. And they started raising their voices and insisting on their opinion in the discussion. So the Prophet of Allah left his own opinion and he is the Prophet of Allah. And followed their opinion and said, all right, we will go out and we will face the kuffar in Uhud. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went inside his room and wore the, uh, wore, wore, uh, the clothes of war. And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came out, the sahaba had talked and calmed each other down and said, are you serious? Are you going to disobey the Prophet's opinion? He said, Prophet of Allah, we are happy. Whatever you say, we will do. So he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no Prophet of Allah puts the clothes of war on and then takes them off again it's we're fighting we're fighting we're leaving now and the muslims go for a battle that was another level 
every battle every battle you will find in the seerah of muhammad sallam was harder than the one before amazingly why because when the iman increases the tests increase so in uhud the sahaba now were prepared so 1,000 strong army, the Muslims are 1,000, the Kafar were 3,000. Still outnumbered, but now we are ready. We are a military now. We have swords, we have horses, we will fight. And now we will have the Rusul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to Uhud in the famous place. Now we go to visit Medina. And unfortunately, those of us who go to Medina, we go visit Uhud like tourists. When we go to Hajj now, like in some narrations of a hadith, it says that the Hajj of rich people of my Ummah one day will become tourism. I want to see Uhud. I want to see uh, Ghar Hira. I want to see Rauda. Please take me, give me a tour. People there, you know, taking selfies in the Kaaba. <laughs> me and the Kaaba, me and the Rauda, me and the Haram, you know. Why? I'm, I, I'm not really here for spiritual benefit. I just want to show people when I get back. I've been to Hajj, mate. Stripes. I'm a Hajji now. Watch, huh? Watch when you talk to me. Tourism. So, when you go to Uhud next time, when you go visit the martyrs there, remember the sacrifice of these people and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach the companions and all the ummah after them a great lesson. A great lesson for the iman. The Prophet of Allah goes to Uhud and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam picks 40 or 40 something arches and puts them on the mountain. If you go there, there's a hill called the hill of arches. He says he made the uh, Jabal Uhud was behind them, you know, and the protection from the side was the hill. And he said, I want you to protect this hill. We win, we lose, we get butchered, we die. Do not leave your positions. Do you understand? Yes, we understand. The archers were put in their position, the army was prepared, the kuffar came with 3,000, the battle started, and the Muslims butchered the kuffar. They smashed them. In the first couple of tens of minutes of the battle, the kuffar started fleeing the battlefield. So when they started fleeing the battlefield, the Muslims, subhanAllah, started running after the booty of war and spoils of war. A bit of dunya came in the heart, some of the archers on the hill saw this sight, they could not hold themselves. Dunya, money, destroyer of deen, the destroyer of our deen. Hubbu dunya, ra'su kull khati'ah. Love of dunya is the nucleus of every sin. The core of every sin is love of this world. So they saw it, they couldn't bear themselves. They said to the leader, Khalas, the battle has finished, everyone's collecting the money, let us take our share. He goes, the Prophet of Allah said, we win, we lose, we get butchered, don't leave your positions. I will not leave here unless Muhammad Sallam says to me. He said, are you serious? You're an extremist. This is too much. Nowadays, when we don't like a ruling of them, what do we say? No, 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 Shaykh, this is too much. It's too much. I can't do that. They left the positions except for a small number. That stayed on the hill. Khalid Nawalid radiallahu anhu at the time, an non Muslim with the army of the Kuffar, he sees the archers leaving position as the Kuffar are fleeing. Khalas, the, the battle has finished. He makes a big U turn and attacks the Muslims from back. He attacks the archers on the hill, attacks the Muslims from behind, and the people that were fleeing returned, and the Muslims were stuck from back and front. People did not know what's happening. The army lost control. Rumors started spreading that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was killed. I want you to put yourself in this situation. The prophet you think is the prophet of Allah coming with revelation protected by the angels has now been killed. What am I fighting for now? And then you see chunks of the Muslim army fleeing the battlefield. People running for their lives. You see main sahaba, big names, sat down. They dropped their swords and they sat down crying. Qutila Muhammad. What's the point of life after him? And then you see those companions who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected in that battle. 
One of them was Anas ibn al-Nadr radiyallahu anhu, the uncle of Anas ibn Malik. Anas ibn al-Nadr radiyallahu anhu in this, situ in this situation. Wallahi, my brothers, wallahi, there is no Hollywood movie, Bollywood movie, any movie in the world that has such courage and valor and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like what the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum did. This man, khalas, main, big names are sitting down, big names fled the field. And this man starts talking to Allah, between him and Allah, says, Oh Allah, I ask your forgiveness from what my companions are doing. Oh Allah, I am free, I detach myself from what these enemies of deen in front of me are doing. And then he, radiallahu anhu, jumped on his horse and fled. He, like a rocket, he went to the campaign of the non-believers and on a suicide mission. When you do that in an old military, it's not a Superman movie, it's not science fiction, he will die, he will die. He knows he will die. And then he starts running with his horse. He meets Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad on the side. And then he calls out to him and says, Ya Sa'ad al-Jannah. That's true, man. How much do you want Jannah? Really, have you ever asked yourself? How much do you want Jannah? What are you willing to give to take Jannah? The truth is, don't talk to me. Don't answer this question. Look in your life. Look in your sacrifices. What you do for deen is really how much you want Jannah. Anas ibn Nadr radiyallahu anhu wanted to give his life for Jannah. Qala ya Sa'ad, o Sa'ad al-Jannah. Inni la ajid reeha al-Jannah min duni Uhud. I can smell Jannah beside Mount Uhud. He went, he started fighting. He killed a couple of them and then they overpowered him in number. And they killed him, mutilated his body, and then he died, radiallahu anhu. They could, no one could identify him except his sister with a, uh, with a mark on his finger. When he did this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse in him and his like. Says what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look at the words. Look at the words. Min al mu'minin. Min al mu'minin. Min in Arabic language is what? Tabaid, min, yani some of the believers, not all believers, not all believers, min al mu'minina rijalun. Some of the believers are men, true men. I'm not talking about men and women. You are male, we are males, but we're not men. Min al mu'minina rijalun. What did you do? Look at the words. Sadaqu ma ahadu Allah alayh. They fulfilled their promise and covenant with Allah. They made a promise and they fulfilled it. من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عهد الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه Some of them were martyred. ومنهم من ينتظر Others are waiting. They can't wait to get martyred. وما بدلوا تبديلا They did not change in the deen. This is a sign, a proof. This man will stand on judgment day when Allah will ask him, did you believe in me? Did you believe in my deen? This man will lift his head up high in pride. Say, Ya Allah, Wallahi, I did. Ya Allah, look on that day. I gave my life for your pleasure. I gave my life for this deen. What will we say? What will me and you say? What, did, what have we given to prove to Allah that he comes first, that this deen comes first? And as such, unfortunately, we're out of time. But battle after battle, from Badr to Uhud to Al-Khandaq to uh, Mu'tah, Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, then Mu'tah, Khaybar, Fath Makkah, conquest, the conquest of Mecca, and then the last battle of Muhammad Sallam, Tabuk. They called it Ghazwat al-Usra, the battle of hardship, even though there was no fighting in this battle. But it was suicidal. Two months, a two-month trip in peak summer, in heat. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum were tested and tested and tested, and they passed with flying colors. Now we read about the seerah. We hear about the seerah, and we have to come back to the future and ask ourselves, what in your life is proof? Of this claimed love of Allah and His Prophet. What, in, what have you given? If I was to ask you now to give your life for deen, would you do? Would you do so? And please don't say, 
You know, we find our boys, mashallah, they all wear army pants. They wear the army pants and jihad vests with uh, cushions, you know, on the back. You know? Wallah, I want to kill all the kuffar in the world. Allah, I'll do this. Allah, I'll do that. Habibi, you are a jahil. You don't know anything of your deen. Your practice shows no sincerity, no akhlaq, no deen, no a'mal. What are you talking about? And I will have to, please, Sheikh, give me two more minutes. I will have to explain to you something very important. You think jihad is violent. You think the fighting of Muhammad Sallallahu was barbaric. Wallahi, we are very wrong, my brothers. The Prophet of Allah was rahma lil alameen, was mercy for humanity, even in his fighting. And I will end by this question. Do you know, as a Muslim, how many people the Prophet of Allah وسلم, killed with his own hands in 23 years? Who knows? Yes? No. One. The Prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, killed one man. One man in his life. Ubayy ibn Khalaf. One man all his life. All, he went to 27 battles. He fought in 27 battles. He killed only one man with his own hands. Tell me that's not Rahmah. A man who could have killed thousands. One man only he killed. You will say, all right, he didn't kill, but he ordered the killing and assassination. I want to ask you another Sira question. In all the life of Rasulullah and his message, what were the casualties of the da'wah of Islam? Who knows? 23 years of da'wah, 13, 10 years of fighting and battles. Badr, Uhud, Al-Khandaq, Al-Hudaybiyah, Khaybar, Mu'ta, Fath Makkah, Tabuk. Huh? Who knows? Do you know how many? The most, most authentic narrations say 203 non-believers. <laughs> Do you believe that number? 203. All the jihad of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the casualties on the enemy's side was 203 human beings. And you know how much of the Muslims? 187. Yani in total, human casualties of the da'wah of Islam and the jihad of Islam at the time was what? 400 people. Some ulama try from here, try from there, dig here, dig there. They said it's 1,000 in total. Some said 1,500 in total. And that's the maximum number, including everything. Even those who are punished in hudud or punishments or treason, everything. 1,500. I'll ask you another question because they call us barbaric. Do you know how many people died in World War I? Do you know? 37 million. 37 million casualties in World War I. Top World War II, who knows? 60, 60, 60 million People died all too. People that preach humanity. We are humans. America, the United States, when it bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the smallest estimates, 150,000 civilians. 150,000 civilians with two bombs. And they say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a violent person. 203 all his life. Because he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wanted people to enter this deen. He didn't want people to die without la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Even the worst of his enemies. He wanted them to understand Islam and accept Islam and accept the message that he came with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Really, by the word, rahma lil alameen. Now this message and this amana has come to me and you. And what have we done with it? Sorry, my brother says, we are too busy collecting money, Buying houses, upgrading our cars, buying the new iPhone 5, 6, 7, and 10, and 20 when it comes, inshallah. Uh, Samsung's, or a new gadget, or a PlayStation, or a this, or get married, or have a swimming pool, or go for a holiday. This is our focus. This is why, my brothers, our purification has not started. 
we have not even entered the washing machine yet. We haven't declared understanding the path and following the path. Like you're in a marathon and you're running in the opposite direction. We're funny people, we're like clowns. We have deen, we have knowledge, but we choose not to act upon it. We have to change. We have to look at the seerah and change our lives and learn lessons and practice them. We have to leave here today different people. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who practice what we hear. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who practice what we hear. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who practice what we hear. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who practice what we hear.